blood pressure cuff, what you wrap around the patient's arm. Inflation bulb. Allow air to tight around the arm. Before you begin, make sure that the bulb is twisted all the way to the right to fully close, otherwise squeezing will be useless. Calibrated manometer gauge. You can gauge how much air you have in by how high the numbers are. Stethoscope. To listen for the pulses. With the arm at heart level, center the inflatable bladder over the brachial artery. The lower border of the cuff should be about 2.5 cm above the anticubital crease. Secure the cuff snugly, slightly flex the patient's arm at the elbow. Place the bell of the stethoscope lightly over the brachial artery. Rapidly inflate the cuff until the radial pulse disappears. With this pressure on the nomometer and add 300 mmHg. Deflate the cuff promptly and completely and wait for 15 to 30 seconds. Using the sum of subsequent inflations prevents discomfort from unnecessarily high cough pressures. After turning on the pediatric scale, ask the mother to put the infant on the scale. Record the weight of the infant in pounds or kilograms, preferably without heavy clothing or shoes. For infantometer, place the child in a supine position. Ask the mother as an assistant to hold the patient's head touching the fixed vertical plank, with legs and buttocks flat on the surface by pressing over the knee and keeping the feet in a right angle. The movable pedal should be against the heels before recording. For older children who can already stand, height can be measured using a stadiometer. The height should be measured standing with bare feet. The patient should stand properly and the head in a neutral position. With the help of a plastic ruler, the topmost point For the use of stethoscope, we will be performing a heart and lung auscultation. We will start first with listening to heart sounds. For listening to S1 and S2 of the heart, we are going to use the diaphragm side of the stethoscope. We will start at the second intercostal space in the right sternal border. As you can see, I am feeling it. This specific intercostal space is also known as the aortic valve area. Next, directly across the sternum is known as the pulmonary valve area. Right below it is the herbs point and then tricuspic valve area. Lastly, the mitral valve area. Here is a picture to better visualize the five landmarks of auscultation of heart sounds. For the next part, we are now listening to lung sounds. As the patient is breathing, I am listening for any sound that is different from normal, which should be just like the sound of air. If you'd notice my hands, just like with the heart auscultation, there are also landmarks and correct flow of listening to a patient's lung sounds. Here, the pattern is like a zigzag bladder. I started from the right, and then from the left, and then below it, and then go to the right side. Here's a picture to better visualize the pattern I was referring to. Head circumference is measured over the most prominent part on the back of the head or your occiput and just above the eyebrows or your supraorbital ridges. This can be translated to mean the largest circumference of the head. Other measurements for special circumstances, chest circumference, the landmarks are the nipples, abdominal circumference, the landmarks are the umbilicus, patients should stand up to get an accurate measurement. The tape measure should rest gently on the skin, and once the tape measure is positioned correctly, read the measurements in centimeters. Place the tip of the thermometer in the center of the armpit. Tuck the child's arms snugly or closely against their body. Hold the thermometer in place for about 1 minute until you hear the beep. Remove the thermometer and read the temperature. Sanitize the thermometer before and after use. Rinse the end of stem or pacifier thermometer with cool water or a cotton with alcohol. Allow the thermometer to dry before using or putting it away. Prior to patient contact, wash your hands, introduce yourself to the patient and explain what you are going to do. Position the patient so that the ophthalmoscope is held directly at the level of the patient's eye. Turn on the ophthalmoscope and set the light to the correct aperture. Dim the lights of the room. Instruct the patient to focus on an object straight ahead on the wall. 
examine the patient's right eye, hold the ophthalmoscope in your right hand, and use your right eye to look through the instrument. Place your left hand on the patient's head and place your thumb on their eyebrow. Hold the ophthalmoscope about 6 inches from the eye and 15 degrees to the right of the patient. Find the red reflex. Move in closer, staying nicely until you see the optic nerve. Rotate the diopter lens until the optic nerve comes into focus. Measure the cup to this ratio. Scan slightly up, down, right and left to look at the vessels. Move out temporally to find the macula and the fovea. Repeat the same technique on the other eye. During examination, it may be necessary to manipulate the angle of the patient's head in order to visualize the structures within the ear. Held the otoscope on the left hand when examining the left ear and the right hand when examining the right ear to give you the most comfortable range of motion when using your other hand to manipulate the patient's head or ear. It may be more difficult to achieve an optimal angle of view on younger patients and infants, requiring careful manipulation of the ear. When inserting the speculum into the patient's ear canal, it is important to take care not to cause damage to the surrounding tissue. Although the speculum typically cannot easily reach the eardrum, the tapered end could cause a scratch or discomfort if angled improperly. Patients with ear infections may experience some discomfort during the insertion process. But if you encounter resistance during this process, it is important to stop and evaluate the ear to avoid causing injury. It is also true if you suspect the patient has a foreign object within the ear canal. The viewing lens on both the standard and the pocket versions of the otoscopes may be moved aside or removed to allow the physical manipulation of objects in the ear canal. In addition, several of the otoscope models are also available with an optimal nasal speculum to facilitate the examination of the nose. This is a tuning fork. It is used for tuning fork tests. Weber test or test for lateralization. Place the base of the lightly vibrating tuning fork firmly on the top of the patient's head or in the mid-forehead. Rhine test. Place the base of lightly vibrating tuning fork on the mastoid bone behind the ear and then quickly place the fork close to the ear canal and ask the patient if he hears a vibration. Vibration sense test. Use a relatively low pitch tuning fork and tap it on the heel of your hand and place it firmly over a distal interphalangal joint of the patient's finger and then over the interphalangal joint of the big toe. Ask the patient if he feels the vibration and then touch the tuning fork to stop it from vibrating and confirm this change with the patient. This is a reflex hammer. It is used for eliciting muscle stretch reflexes. Hold the reflex hammer loosely between your thumb and index finger so it swings freely in an arc within the limit set by your palm and other fingers. It should be quick and direct and not glancing. Reflexes are usually graded on a 0 to 4 scale. 